Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, um, and thank you very much to Modella um, and Mokena Mokeke and the MDL team for organizing and inviting me to participate this evening. Um, I think this event goes straight to the heart of what I'd like to address this evening, and that is the production of locality or critical difference um, and the necessity for us to commence doing things in a new and different way. 18 years is exceptionally young for a new nation, particularly one emerging from the tyranny of colonialism and the trope of, or a, a ubiquitous mentality of whiteness. The triumph of democracy in South Africa came late in the struggle for freedom and on the African continent. And the current imperatives of globalization coincide with the local demands for redress of a disenfranchised majority and the concomitant production of our own locality. Globally, discourse around urbanization is predominated by data, by facts and figures, all sorts of numbers predicting massive urbanization, densification, scaling up at increased speeds, and massive um, intensification of rural migration. All this in the context of an enduring modernity that is predominantly intolerant of tradition and local or other practices that tradition might demand. In his treatise for the city yet to come, Malik Simon has recognized a unique capacity on the African continent. His suggestion is that the social networks that underpin the informal economies provide an invisible infrastructure that must be critically understood and interpreted in any attempt to project a new African city. This observation is underpinned by a recognition of the need for an alternative political economy to that of the so-called Western democracy and its capital project and economic utilitarianism. Essentially, he's demanding a new structural paradigm for organizing human existence. Vanessa Watson identifies the competition between opposing rationalities as perhaps the most significant issue within our globalizing context. Conflicts between state and community, between rich and poor, between tradition and maternity, modernity, and between architectural form and everyday practice. These tensions, the tensions in these multiple binaries produce complexity and contradiction between seemingly disparate forces, which under current forms and process remain irreconcilable, and hence the questionable success of so many public projects. How then do we operate within a horizon of uncertainty, and what does it mean to practice and teach under the instability of rapidly altering conditions? In his questioning of modernity, uh, Arjan Apadurai has identified the production of locality as a primary trope for global transformation. Unfortunately for architects, he's not implying spatial or scalar change, but rather in us being relational and contextually informed. The challenge embedded here is for architects to shift their conventional comfort zone and engage in new forms of research and discovery that might produce altered conditions. The answer to these type of questions and tasks is never direct, nor is it easy. They demand time and experimentation and the asking of thoughtful questions, such as what is possible under a given set of circumstances, but interrogated through reflective action such as to bring about genuine change and a shift in the consciousness of particular communities, such as architects, as learners and practitioners. It also implies risk-taking and possible failure it is a line of thinking that places incredible pressure on tertiary education institutions to reconceptualize their teaching practice. It is no longer acceptable to solve, to creatively solve problems or to respond to a brief with a pre-given site and program which inevitably produces the, fam the familiar. The conventional role of the architect, notably that of a singular author, is becoming perhaps the most contested role. The complexities of contemporary conditions demand that we shift our peculiar comfort and predilection within the realm of form. Critical difference emerges when people start thinking and acting differently. We might confidently say that the time has arrived for architects to start co-producing form through critical engagement in a non-hierarchic manner. To operate within a horizon of interconnectivity implies to critically collaborate with other actors, be they professionals, clients, communities, local authorities, in such a way as to emulate the social network that describes the informal economy that Malik Simon has identified. 
Whilst within the realm of architecture, design agency might sponsor co-production, there should be clear evidencing of innovation that is specific to a particular project. Why is it that architects are still predominantly recognized by the style evoked from their formal representation? In his seminal publication, Architecture in the Crisis of Modern Science, Alberto Perez Gomez critiques the instrumentality of Enlightenment discourse and its effects on architectural thinking, making, and rep representation. He, he, he pro pro proclaims um, The creation of order in a mutable and finite world is the ultimate purpose of all man's thought and actions. This is a trope of thought that has significantly contributed to the production of situated modernisms throughout the world whereby the location of, cult of culture directly impacts on the application of modernist principles, particularly in the colonies. That certain local imperatives could be considered as non-negotiable provides a basis on which creative endeavor might project modern tendencies, as opposed to simply descending from the sky and overwriting the pre-existent. In South Africa, the political economy of colonialism and apartheid was predicated on a system that enabled the radical exploitation of black labor The system is currently being extended in South Africa's contemporary post-apartheid global era as we witness the gradual removal of labor from the site. And one might observe too that similar dig similarly digital technologies removing embodied encounters from the design production. What characterizes our society in Cape Town in particular is a tripart alliance between poverty, inequity and unemployment. And design is complicit in this trajectory. Increasingly excluding the majority of our population from economic engagement, we hamper development and reinforce the status quo. In Cape Town, this is exacerbated by apartheid's alliance with topography, which has served to entrench spatial inequity, perhaps the most abiding legacy of apartheid. The Cape Town yet to come needs to reflect a more aggressive engagement with the exigencies of spatial justice, because that is a primary route to economic opportunity and the endurance of this landscape of inequity will ensure Cape Town's inability to participate globally. Inclusivity, viewed differently or more architecturally, resides in the tension between socio-economic practice and the former manifestation that drives spatial production. What do these considerations infer for the project of architecture? Are we as a design community capable of critically reorienting our thinking to affect new forms of making and subsequent representation. Why has the architectural design profession not been able to transcend the RDP house? What underpins our inability to engage social housing as human settlement? And what is the potential for economic and spatial justice when recipients become co-producers of urban and architectural form? I believe that the impetus for radical change should emanate from tertiary education institutions, for this is where current attitudes to design practice are reproduced. The freedom from the responsibility to gain, to engage under normative conditions of a regulated environment implies an experimental space that is no longer geographically bound. The binding imperatives are those of critical inquiry and ethical responsibility implying a laboratory for the interrogation that is capable of nomadic action in seeking out relevance. At the University of Cape Town, we have tested these within the logic of our own circumstances. Design, build, research, and the simulated office project have afforded platforms for departure within our limited and gradually transforming domain. At Columbia University, Studio X literally crosses national boundaries, bringing students into encounters with difference that radically and appropriately contest the subjectivity at advanced levels. In a re recent retrospective at his Eco South African National Gallery, local struggle artist Peter Clark's exhibition entitled Listening to the Distant Thunder describes his ability to produce creative work under the apartheid era through a capacity for engaging the other, of shifting from the confines of his local discomfort and suffering through a critical engagement with international discourses from which he was precluded by virtue of his race, through the medium of radio. Whatever the means, things will not shift until we strategically start reorienting ourselves in ways that mediate the divides that so aptly identifies our society. Producing our own locality does not imply a license to abrogate responsibly. It is a challenge to read our context more critically, to interpret them more conceptually, and to translate them through architectural representation more creatively. 
in order that we might constructively transform the worlds we inhabit. This requires the reorientation of our current modalities to think new ways of being and engagement in our communities, ways which might probably demand sacrifice. Thank you.